I want to read tonight, please, if you'll turn to the book of Isaiah, and we're in chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, we're going to begin to read in verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1. It says there, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not feel nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith the God, sorry, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. We finish our reading there, and as always, we look to the Lord that we will know his blessing and his touch upon his word this evening for his name's sake. Whenever you read through this entire section of the book of Isaiah, Whenever I say this section, I'm talking about chapters 40 through to chapter 45. You see particularly in these chapters how God reveals himself to his people and encourages his people to trust completely in him. And in these chapters, he reveals several aspects of his greatness. I want to just throw something out at you. If you're reading, you can keep it in mind. You can perhaps pursue it if you want to. But in these chapters, he reveals several aspects of his greatness. For instance, in chapter 40, he speaks of, we're not going to look at it, but he speaks in chapter 40 of the greatness of his person. Friends, there's no one like our God. In chapter 41, he speaks of the greatness of his purpose. The Bible tells us his ways are higher than our ways, and his ways are past finding out the greatness of his purpose. In chapters 44 and 45, those two chapters speak of the greatness of his promises. Thank God for his promises this evening. His promises, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, they are yea and amen in our Lord Jesus Christ. His promises cannot fail. The hymn writer could say, standing on the promises of Christ our King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Praise God tonight. His word is forever settled in heaven, and his word is secure. And that's chapters 44 and 45. In chapter 42 here, we see something of the greatness of his pardon. His pardon. Praise God tonight. We worship and we serve. And we proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, a Savior who is rich in mercy, a Savior who is full of grace, a Savior whose pardon is beyond comprehension. And in this chapter, we see something of the greatness of that pardon. We are introduced to him in this chapter, thinking of him at his first coming. We have just come through the, the Christmas season, a time when very much... We focus upon the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This chapter in many ways picks up on that. 
And this chapter speaks of or highlights his first coming in humility and coming in grace at that first Christmas time where unto us a son was given that he might redeem mankind. And these verses speak to us of that wonderful Savior. They speak of his meekness and they speak of his gentleness. Let me read you verse 3 again. It says in verse 3, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Friends, he's meek, he's lowly, he's gentle. He knows just how to handle The individual soul. Sometimes the soul is in need. Sometimes the life is under tremendous pressure. And he's gentle. He's meek. He knows exactly how to minister. And he knows how to handle those who are in that kind of experience. And so that verse speaks of his meekness and his gentleness. And yet further down, we read also, we'll read it verse 7 in just a moment. Because verse 7 speaks of his power and speaks of his sufficiency. It says in verse 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. You see, thank God tonight, he's gentle and he's meek. But thank God also tonight, he is the all-powerful one. Hallelujah. The one whose power and whose sufficiency is beyond human comprehension. And so we see something of the greatness of his pardon. And if you read the entire chapter and chapter 43, the chapter following, you will see something more of that. But this evening for just a time, I want us to focus our thoughts upon verse 6 that we have read together here. Verse 6. Let me read the verse to you once again. It says, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee And give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Words, of course, that are speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of our Savior. But nevertheless, words also, I believe, that speak so well to us as well. Words that challenge each and every one of us who's here this evening. Let me read the verse again. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. There are four thoughts, if you like, or four words that I want us to focus upon, that I want us to consider for just a short time this evening. As we leave another year behind, remember we're still on the first Sunday of a new year. And we're thinking about leaving another year behind as it is drawn to its close. We have stepped out, as it were, into a new year. Who only knows what the canvas of this year may hold for any of us? The Bible says we should not boast ourselves of tomorrow. We don't know what another day is going to bring forth. But nevertheless, at a new year time, as we were thinking about this this morning, we think about a new beginning. We think about the opportunity of a year that just seems to be opening up before us. And we wonder and we look at it in anticipation for what that year might bring our way or what we might see accomplished. And we reflect upon the way that we have come up to now and then we look ahead to the way that lies before us. And the question is for each one of us this evening, the question is simply this, friends, where are we standing? Where are you standing this evening? Now you're not standing on that beach that's up on on the screen there. But where are you standing spiritually this evening? Where are you standing? You see, the first thing that we see in verse 6 here is the thought or the word called. It says in verse 6, I the Lord have called thee. Our Lord Jesus Christ was called upon in eternity. The Bible tells us that from before the foundation of the word, he was the lamb, he is the lamb that was slain. Somewhere in the economy of God, in eternity, the Father and the Son hatched the plan whereby mankind could be redeemed from sin and from corruption and from death. And Jesus was called upon in eternity to make salvation possible. That's the context of these words that we have in verse 6. 
But what about us here this evening? What about you and me? You see, each one of us this evening has also been called. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is in the business of calling men and women and calling young people onto himself. All are called. We can think of his own words on that occasion. He says, come on to me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden. He says, I will give you rest. Come on to me. There's a call that comes from the heart of the Savior tonight. And the call goes out to all. And yet the sad thing this evening is all have not responded to that call. And I wonder, could there be anyone, and you're sitting in this meeting perhaps tonight, and the call has come to your heart. You've sensed the call of God tugging at your heartstrings. You've heard the call of God to your life. You know that you need to be saved by grace. And his call has come to you. And it could be you're here tonight and perhaps you're one of those people who as yet hasn't responded to that call. You see, this is a call to salvation. It's not just a call to salvation, but it's a call to holy living. It says there in verse 6, I have called thee in righteousness. It's a call to be done with sin. It's a call to turn your back upon the word. It's a call that's issued by God, bringing us unto God through the righteousness of God, demonstrated in the person of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, friends, you and I could never stand in the presence of God. You and I are sinners by nature. We are, are sinners by, by deed. Even our very thoughts can be sinful. We could never approach God's presence. We could never approach into God's holiness. We are unclean, the Bible says. We are unworthy. We are unlovely. Some even say we're unlovable. We are unrighteous. And yet tonight we have a Savior, praise God, who loves the unlovely, who loves the unlovable, who loves the unrighteous, who loves the unworthy, who loves the unclean to the extent that he went to the cross of Calvary. And here we have his call. And through the cross of Calvary, through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed upon that cross, our sins, our unrighteousness, our unworthiness, our uncleanness. Thank God tonight they can all be dealt with. Hallelujah. Every one of them can be dealt with. And his spotless life of sinlessness and righteousness and tremendous worth, the Son of God, can be yours and, praise God, can be mine. What a glory the cross is. You see, friends, tonight, that's the greatness of God's pardon. Not only does he forgive us from our sin, not only is he a God who's rich in mercy and rich in grace, not only is he a God who laid down his life that we could be forgiven for our sin, but then he makes us presentable in righteousness before him so that we can know him, so that we can stand, praise God, in his presence. How does God do that? He does it quite simply because Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He came into this world, he took our sin, he took our place, he took our punishment, and he suffered and he died at the cross of Calvary, dear one, for you and for me. His perfect, his sinless, his spotless life was given for each one of us. And whenever a person turns unto him, his righteousness is given to that seeking soul and praise God, sin is removed. And you see tonight, his call goes out. It's a call from the heart of a Savior who longs to draw all men, all women, all young people unto himself. And that call goes out. And that's what he calls each one of us to this evening. It's a call to salvation. A call to exchange those filthy, sin-tattered garments 
for the pure white robe of righteousness that only he can give. Can I ask again this evening, have you responded to this call? The verse says here, I, the Lord, have called you or called thee in righteousness. Praise God it doesn't end there. Because the next thought or the next word that I want to focus on in the verse is the thought or the word held. He says here, I will hold thine hand. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. You know, it's a call to salvation. But friends, here's a call to companionship. I will hold thine hand. What a glorious thought this is. The almighty God, creator, sustainer, giver of all life, the high one, the holy one, the lofty one, the one who has the adoration and praise of, the, of myriad, myriads of angels. And yet here, this almighty God, he wants to be our friend. He wants to be our companion. The Bible calls him the friend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who sticketh closer than a brother. The almighty God, ruler of the entire universe. And he says, I will hold thine hand. He wants to in fellowship, in companionship with him. The moment we respond to his call, praise God, he becomes our friend. His name is faithful and true. His name, we were thinking about this, it was one of the readings over Christmas. His name is Wonderful Counselor. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Wonderful Counselor, that speaks of wisdom. He is all wise. He possesses all wisdom. The mighty God, that speaks of all power, omnipotent, almighty God. The everlasting Father, that speaks of his eternality. No mere mortal man, but the one who is the ancient of days, from everlasting unto everlasting. The Prince of Peace, that speaks of his grace, praise God, and his mercy. And in Isaiah, that chapter 9, Isaiah goes on and he says, The government shall be upon his shoulder. That shows us, friends, that he is King of Kings. And he is Lord of Lords. Listen, he is the altogether glorious one. The altogether lovely one. Can you see who he is this evening? He is Lord of all. Yet here he wants to hold you by the hand. To be your friend. To be your loving companion. He wants to be in fellowship and companionship with you. If you will allow him. Again, let me ask tonight. Have you allowed that in your life? Have you allowed him to draw near to be with you in that way in your situation? Will you respond to his call of salvation? Will you allow him to hold your hand in companionship? Because friends, what an offer, what a tremendous offer this is to each and every one of us, the almighty God. What a privilege that we should know him or be allowed to draw near to him in this way. And again, the verse doesn't stop there because the third thought that we see in this verse, he says in this verse, he says, I will keep thee. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee. That speaks to me of a call to preservation. I will preserve you, he says. I will keep you. If you trust him, praise God, he will never let go of your hand. What a glory that is tonight. He can keep you. He will preserve your soul. Now, let me say this, please. Kept doesn't mean that all will be a bed of roses. Because a believer isn't always kept from temptation and trial. Nor is he or she kept from sorrow or kept from affliction. Nor is he or she, the believer, kept from someone who's put it like this, crosses and losses nor kept from, but kept in, and sometimes kept through. And friends, listen to me, please. Sometimes kept by the things that we are called 
to go through in life. All of the processes of discipline. Let me read you Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2. It says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I give Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Praise God, he preserves. See, friends, what a pardon this is. He forgives our sin. He makes us right in his sight. He takes us by the hand. He enters into companionship with us. And then he tells us that no matter what we might be called upon in life to face, no matter what we might have to go through in life, he tells us he will never praise God ever, ever, ever let us go. That's his pardon tonight. That's his pardon. What a glorious thing. That's the greatness of his pardon. And the Bible says, Him whom the Son sets free, praise God, is free and free indeed. You see, tonight, that's what his pardon offers to all who will obey his call. Can I ask tonight, have you heard his call? Have you responded to that call? Because, friends, what an offer. What an offer this really is. And then lastly, let me just bring you the fourth thought that we see in this little verse. Because lastly he says, And give thee for a covenant of the people to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners. Let me read the verse to you in its entirety once again. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Here we have the word used. I will use you. I will give you for a covenant, he says. I will use you. This speaks of service. You see, whenever God saves us, God wants to use us in his kingdom. He wants to use us to tell others about him, about his great love, about his, his, his desire, his passion that men and women might be saved. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn from their wickedness and live. And if you're saved tonight, he wants to use you, and he wants to use me in that way, to warn others, to tell others about the greatness of his love and the greatness of his power, to lift the deepest dyed sinner out of the pit and to be able to present them spotless before his presence with exceeding glory. And so we have this thought of service used whenever God saves us. He wants to use us to tell others, others to bring honor and to bring glory unto his holy name. And so we see in this verse these four simple thoughts. Called to salvation. Held in companionship. Kept in preservation. And used in service for the King of kings and for the Lord of lords. Can I ask this evening, does that describe your life? Can you sit here tonight and say that you have heard the call and responded to his call to salvation? Can you sit here tonight and say, yes, that he holds your hand, that you're in companionship with him? Can you sit here tonight with the full assurance that he has promised he will never Let you go, but he will see you through and preserve you through life and out into eternity to be in his presence. Can you sit here tonight and say, yes, there's been times in my life when the Spirit of God has come upon me and I have been enabled by God to share with others the great things that the Lord has done for me. Is that how you sit here this evening? Because, dear one, if it's not, can I say, it can be. If you will respond to this call this evening, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. You know, someone has said that no one has the right to hear the gospel twice whenever there are people in the world who have never even heard it once. And friends, sometimes if the truth is being told, we listen to the gospel message and we treat it so lightly 
whenever we fail to realize that perhaps that particular time that we're listening to it might be the last time that we ever get opportunity to sit under the sound of the call of God as he tugs at our heartstrings to draw him onto himself. You know, the story is told of, of Francis Ridley Havergal, the poetess, whose lyrics have cheered the hearts of, of so many pilgrims along the way. And the story is told that in her last moments of life, she asked a friend, if her friend would read to her from this chapter of Isaiah, chapter 42, if her friend would just read some verses from this chapter, and whenever her friend started to read in this chapter, she read down as far as verse 6. I'm going to read it to you again. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. And whenever her friend got to this verse, Miss Havergal stopped her and she said, called, held, kept, used. And then she whispered, well, I will go home on that. I will go home on that. And she did go home on that. Making this verse, making this promise, her triumphal chariot in which she went in through the gates of pearl, into his nearer presence and into the city of gold that the Bible speaks about. Called, held, kept, used. Oh, friends, that's the glory of his great pardon tonight. He calls us, he holds us, he keeps us, he uses us. And whenever life ebbs to its close, praise God, he ushers us into his nearer presence to be with him throughout all of eternity because he loves us and he has given himself for us at the cross of Calvary. Again, can I ask tonight, have you heard this call? Have you responded to this call? Because only you can respond to this call in your own heart and in your own life. And oh, tonight may this be our experience, every one of us. When Jesus comes or whenever Jesus calls us home, may we be able to go with that full assurance, I was called, I was held, I was kept. And I was used for his name's sake and for his glory. Let's just pray for a moment. Praise God. Praise God. And I want you just to search your heart tonight. Just as we draw our meeting to a close, as we think about, as we reflect upon his word, the Lord's word to our hearts this evening, the call of God that goes out. Again, let me ask you tonight, what have you done with the call of God? Have you responded? Are you washed in the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come by faith unto him, called upon him to be your Lord and your Savior? Do you know his hand in your hand this evening? Why don't you just reach out? Why don't you respond to him now? Maybe there's someone here and you just sense his voice right now. You feel him tugging at your heart strength. And you know, you know within your heart that you need to get right with him. I'm going to pray in just a moment, but I want to give you just an opportunity tonight, just in the stillness of these moments of this meeting. If you hear him call, if you hear his voice tonight, respond to him now. What a glorious thing to be able to look back to the first Sunday night of a new year, 2014, and to be able to testify, I met with the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard his voice 
I answered his call. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. Why don't you trust him tonight? In the stillness of your heart, blessed God. Blessed God. Blessed Savior. Father, tonight you know every single person who's bowed before you. Lord, we have gathered around your truth tonight. Lord, nothing complicated in any way about what we've looked at. And we know tonight, Lord, that you're in the business of calling people out of nature's darkness, out of sin, into your marvelous light, into your glorious grace, and into your forgiveness. We thank you tonight, Lord, for the pardon that we can experience through the finished work of Calvary. Lord, we ask tonight that there would be those in this place who would respond, would say yes to the claims of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and know the joy of sins forgiven, and know the glory of all of these things that we have just touched upon this evening. Simple things, Lord, and yet so priceless and so precious. May some soul in this place tonight, Lord, be brought into the glory of all that we have touched upon and thought about. And so we commit each soul to you. We commit your word to you. And we ask you, Lord, to bless it. Holy Spirit, move, we humbly ask, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.